So one wonderful exercise you can do, and I do this a lot, is that when I feel completely furious, for example, at BP, and it blinds my judgment that these are real people in really difficult situations themselves who have been addicted to a false vision of reality but are also divine and need compassion and prayers for their clear seeing, because if they don't see clearly, millions more people will be impoverished and millions more animals might die. So when you see it like that, then you are really looking at the whole human family and trying to find the relationships between things, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Do you have a copy of uh, Heart Yoga near you by any chance? Yes, I could find one. I could stagger up from my couch where I'm enjoying this conversation tremendously and go and see if I can find one. I hope you're enjoying this conversation as much as I am. Thank you for... Absolutely, indeed. Speaking so clearly and asking these wonderful questions is such a relief because <laughs> usually I feel I'm speaking Sanskrit and I feel you really do hear what I'm saying or trying to say and help me become more clear. Thank you so much. Hey, thank you. Appreciate you being here. So one of the reasons why I asked you about the uh, uh, the proximity of the book is uh, in the in- introduction you have message from the Hopi elders. Yes. I thought it was incredibly prescient. Um, for for the time that we're in right now, I mean, you were you're ahead of the curve on this, and um, I I you know I would I was gonna read it, but you know, Andrew, you'd read it much better than I would. So I'm wondering if you could grace us with a uh, recitation. Oh, I would love to. I anything to impersonate a Hopi. I think the real wisdom is coming from the indigenous traditions now, and we must listen because the indigenous elders are extremely alarmed, and I just in Chartres, saw a DVD of messages from the indigenous elders from all over the world to the world at this moment, and I'm trying to get a film made to help them say this message to the world at large, because it's a very strong message. It really is a message that very, very difficult times are coming, and we have to prepare, and we have to understand what is possible and what could happen, and that we've got to get real about stopping pollution and environmental destruction in our catastrophically dissociated forms of life very soon because otherwise we're just inviting annihilation. I mean, it's a very strong teaching. It's got no fluff about it, and I think it's time for the world to hear it. So the Hopi comes from the same tradition, the ones who have lived so deeply in communion with both the transcendent and the eminent in the earth, on the earth, and they're warning us and they're encouraging us so speaking of the great death and encouraging us towards the birth. And this is what the Hopi say. We have been telling the people that this is the 11th hour. Now you must go back and tell the people that this is the hour. And there are things to be considered. Where are you living? What are you doing? What are your relationships? Are you in right relation? Where is your water? Know your garden. It is time to speak your truth, create your community, be good to each other, and do not look outside yourself for the leader. This could be a good time. There is a river flowing now very fast. It is so great and swift that there are those who will be afraid. They will try to hold on to the shore. They will feel they are being torn apart and they will suffer greatly. No, the river has its destination. The elders say we must let go of the shore and push off into the river. Keep our eyes open and our heads above water. See who is there in with you and celebrate. At this time in history, we are to take nothing personally, least of all ourselves. For the moment that we do, our spiritual growth and journey comes to a halt. The time of the lone wolf is over. Gather yourselves. Banish the word struggle from your attitude and your vocabulary. All that you do now must be done in a sacred manner and in celebration. We are the ones we have been waiting for. Said by the elders of the Hopi Nation at Araibi, Arizona on June the 8th, 2000, announcing this tremendous last turn of the ancient indigenous calendars 
that is our last hope and final hope to really turn this around. That's uh, that's incredibly uh, timely for for where we are now, especially the relationship with water. As you know, uh, in the area that that you're close to, they they have the uh, Ogallala uh, Aquifer, which is one of the uh, biggest aquifers on the planet, and it's about a quarter dry now. Yeah. And and it's a it's it, it you know we we hear the the, the 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 daily well sometimes we hear the daily news about the Gulf but we're in a serious water crisis on this planet and uh, that's oh the water is going to be now the source of wars yeah there'll be water wars because the livelihood of millions the survival of millions will depend upon them and it's going to be simply horrific it's insane what we've let happen to water. But it's such a symbol of our insanity because water is the fundamental element of life. We should have cherished it above all things. So, as you uh, move from that from that wonderful prayer, um, you you have another section called "Setting Your Intention for the Sacred." Can you talk a little bit about that? Well, one of the things that I think characterizes the Americanization of yoga is that it's made yoga very much a, a kind of higher narcissism. You just go and you do these fantastic exercises that make you feel fabulous and you look thin and fabulous, and that helps you in your great American dream of realizing the perfect life with the perfect Malibu condo. And there's that vision of yoga, which is a trivialization of yoga, because yoga is meant to be a discipline for the divinization of the whole being, including the body. And that is an enormously sacred discipline. So that you cannot really be beginning to practice yoga in the way that we are envisaging it in heart yoga without realizing that you're not practicing this self-liberation for yourself alone. In fact, you'll never achieve it if you practice it for yourself alone because there is no self. You are inextricably connected to everything. So you'll only be truly practicing this yoga if you dedicate every single emotion of joy and peace that you have while doing the practice to the liberation of all sentient beings. And really pray that all the ease and joy that you experience in yoga is given immediately away to all sentient beings to relieve them of suffering and that you are forged by this practice to become a wish-fulfilling jewel, a bodhisattva, a sacred activist, a tender warrior lover of service, who goes out into the world to take all of this unified force field into reality and sacred action. So, when you really have dedicated your whole practice and all of its joys and peace to sentient beings in that way, then I give three prayers from different traditions which are wonderful to say at that moment because they allow you to focus your entire intention to the whole of reality, to to the transformation of reality into the divine birth. And this is very important because if you don't really, really go into that dimension of sacredness immediately, then you won't have the full experience of yoga. Right. Um, I, well, it's interesting because, you know, there's this book called, I think it's called The Great Oom, which is about the story of yoga uh, as it was brought into this country. I forget the guy's name, but it's uh, the title of the book is called The Great Oom. That's what he called himself. And, and as a result of that original intention, I believe that there is a layer of pacification uh, associated with yoga and this, this, tra- this transcendental reality that people have been trying to achieve through yoga. And what you're talking about is something very different. It's a, it's a, it's a different tableau for yoga in general. Well, traditional yoga has the aim of kaivalya, which is really separation from the body, that you do traditional yoga in order to attain the state of the self, which knows that the body is transient and the only reality is the self. And that aligns it with classical Vedanta 
and the systems of renunciation of India, which are very profound and have great truths. But the yoga of the heart, the heart yoga is a tantric yoga, so therefore it demands three stages. It demands that you do know your divine consciousness, but that then you start the difficult work of marrying that consciousness to your mind and heart and eventually to your body so that the whole of your being and all of its desires and impulses and shadows can be transmuted into living service of divine love and so that you can be born as a divine human being. That is a different path. And our heart yoga is dedicated to that path while honoring absolutely the other path because if you're taking the true second path, you're going to have to learn all the truths and honor all the truths of the Kaivalya path, of the renunciation path, because unless your um, embrace of the world is purified by ascesis and renunciation, it will be tainted by subtle desire, which could be very dangerous and not enable you to have the full tantric experience. So they belong to each other. But the heart yoga is a path of embodiment of incarnation and that requires really an understanding of the five great joys of the sacred marriage that the sacred marriage is the ultimate reality of the universe as portrayed in all the great traditions and it's a marriage in which the one becomes the two each part of which contains aspects of the other such as in the yin yang diagram which then deeply interpenetrate and make love to each other in all sorts of ecstatic ways to create the entire universe. And that is what is happening in reality. So that is what you need to get into connection with at the deepest level, with the ananda of that immense, radiant intermingling and interpenetration of absolute and relative light and matter spirit and body, heart and mind, all the polarities fundamentally unified in cosmic, conscious, blissful lovemaking, which produces the ultimate ananda, the, the ultimate bliss. And this bliss has five aspects, which we consecrate in heart yoga and develop very simple but very powerful asana sequences to embody and use to help people embody the deepest aspects of them, very beautiful poetry, mystical poetry from Rumi and Hafez and Mechthild of Magdeburg and others, and also beautiful holy light practices and workings with the chakra body so as to give people a very deep sense of how various bodies interpenetrate in the body and are simultaneously ignited by a more conscious yoga. So this is what heart yoga is doing. Mm. Now, are you planning on doing a DVD along with this book at some point? Yes, but I think it may be early days yet. We're actually about to unfold the whole of heart yoga for two days with my institute tomorrow and the next day, and we're going to film it. And we're going to see, looking at the film, whether we've got to the right place of being able to communicate just how potentially radical and transforming this yoga really is. Because you need, I've found very often when you're bringing in a vision that you've tested in very secret circumstances. We tested this yoga for five years on up in British Columbia where Karuna lives and in various small spiritual centers. And each time we were amazed at how powerful it was and also learned a great deal from what people were experiencing and what we were experiencing. So now I think we are ready to give it out, but we've got to find the right medium, the right art, the right music, the right setting to do it, because I think it could be done in a very holy and inspiring way, which we need to think through. It seems like it's a natural fit based on what I've been able to read so far with the book and the various poses. And um, It would be a wonderful DVD. I'm just trying to think of how... It needs to be accompanied by music, by poetry, just to, yeah. as a complete feast for the senses of the soul. I, I totally agree. 